Good morning, College Drive. How's everybody doing today? Good, wonderful, awesome, excellent. Well, you look great, so I guess there's that. Um, Welcome to everybody that's watching online as well. Um, It's a great community to be a part of, amen? I love this church. Would everybody just please stand with us this morning? Um, If you couldn't tell, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the day that we remember Palm Sunday, Jesus triumphant entry into Jerusalem when he's riding on a donkey. If you remember the message a couple weeks ago, he talked about the donkey actually being an animal representative of peace rather than riding in on a horse as a warrior. We know he is a warrior. He's the Lion of Judah. He's done great things for us, and he's conquered the grave. But imagine that. He still chose to enter in peace even knowing what the people were going to do to him. So this morning, we get to celebrate Palm Sunday, what our Savior has done. Amen? worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great done great You've been faithful through every storm You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will 
Suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south And east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we'd hear Christ be Praise arise, Christ be magnified 
Amen. You may be seated. Awesome. Sweet. Thanks, guys, for leading us in worship. That was awesome. All right. Well, good morning, Calls Drive. It's good to see you guys. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Carson. I'm the youth pastor here, and beside me is Haley. And no, we did not call each other to see if we're matching today. This just happened. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much to everyone who came and to those all who are online as well. Um, got a few announcements for you this morning. First and foremost is, do, 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 first and foremost, welcome. But uh, yeah, just to those who are online as well, we're going to be hearing from Callum uh, later this bit, but uh, yeah, I think you have something exciting to share though too. All right, so there's some special congratulations to David and Jessica Scott who had their baby girl Sophie this past week on April 5th. Yeah, so they're all at home and doing good, so they're probably a little sleepy, but other than that, they're doing good, so. Yeah, I would imagine so. That's, that's awesome. Um, also for this coming Friday, uh, we're going to be having a Good Friday service over at Legacy Park. So if you want to come for the picnic afterwards, it's going to be great. You are not bringing your own food, or bring your own food, sorry. Um, yeah. I've got this wrong twice in a row, apparently. Last week I told you to, that there will be food, and this week, yes. Okay, so bring your own food, please. Um, <laughs> there's not going to be food waiting for you. So yeah, please come at 4 p.m. And I guess just for clarity's sake, there will be no youth that Friday also. So if you're a youth or someone that owns, has a youth, uh, please, <laughs> please come. And it's going to be a great time. So yeah. All right. So um, on Easter Sunday, we're going to be having a sunrise prayer service. Um, so if you really like getting up really early and you really like Kimball and you really like praying then that would probably be the place for you to be at 615. So that's going to be at Legacy Park as well, uh, at the same spot as the Good Friday service. And we did send out a little bit of a map in the drive for that spot. And we'll be posting it on the Facebook events as well. So if you need help finding that, then those are the places to check. And then after that, uh, we're going to have our regular uh, Sunday service at 1030. But feel free to join us at 10 a.m. for some... Easter baking and a candy hunt for the kids. So that should be really good. Um, also for the young adults tonight, uh, th there's no slide for this, but for at 6 p.m. tonight, so they're going to be going bowling. So if you're between the ages of 18 and sure, you can come. It's going to be a good time. Um, and yeah, just me at Galaxy Bowling's over by uh, Park Meadows Church, if you know where that is. So come go bowling. It's going to be a good time. Uh, also, we're going to be dismissing the kids uh, today for Kids Quest. So, if you're between the ages of three to grade five, you can go with Michelle. And yeah, going to be also bringing Carol up for prayer points. And then after that, we'll be hearing from Callum on the big screen for our sermon today. So, good morning. As we've already said, today is Palm Sunday. And in our study of Mark, we've been uh, reflecting on Jesus' ministry, his life, and how the crowds gathered around him. Uh, people wanted to hear his words. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to touch even the hem of his garden garment just to be healed. They were drawn to him and the truth that he spoke. They were looking for him as the promised Messiah that would establish a new kingdom. He told them what was to come. And even though they didn't fully understand it, they believed in the promise. So as Jesus approached Jerusalem, their excitement gathered, the crowds grew, the cheers were amplified, and a display of cloaks and palm branches lined the path as he rode into Jerusalem, marking the celebration of the arrival of this new kingdom. And there were many in the crowd who were very full of expectation and adoration, and they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna! There were probably some in the crowd who didn't exactly believe or know what to believe about a king and what he might change, but they wanted to be part of it, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Others remained skeptical, but they were really drawn in by this king, this Jesus, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna. I'm sure there were many that had questions in that crowd. Why is the promised king riding in on a donkey? How exactly is he going to overthrow the leaders of the day? Why 
is Jesus' face so serious? Why does he speak about death when he's rising into power? And others may even say, I don't even know if I should join in the Hosannas. And as the next week progressed, all of them would be changed as a result of what happened. Some would see his death as a reason for their skepticism to be confirmed. Some would turn away in disbelief because this is not what I expect of a king. Some would not want to believe, but they would curtail their celebration out of full fear. And others would begin to realize the truth about the words that Jesus had spoken and recognize that he was a king, but in an unexpected way. And the hosannas that they once voiced so loudly were now head and heartfelt, hosanna, hosanna, bowing at the feet of Jesus. I often wonder where I would have found myself in that crowd. I know where I wanted to be, but I'm not sure. It's a good question, I think, for all of us to ask ourselves. Where would we have found ourselves in that crowd? And so I ask you to think about that as we pray. Join with me. Father, we love a celebration. We love to join in our worship times together. Our hearts swell with the promises that you've given us and the expectations of what is to come. And we recognize you as king. But we confess that we are fickle. We flee when things get challenging. We turn our backs when things don't go the way we pictured they would. We apologize that we fail to see the concerns and grieves of your heart. We miss opportunities to be your hands and feet, serving those in need who are often right in front of us. But you continually forgive us, and you call us to turn our attention to you and your priorities. Help us to hear what hurts you so that we can work to change it. Help us to see the needs of others and to respond generously. Help us to grow in our trust and our belief so that we will hold firmly and not flee. Help us to be willing witnesses of your good news and saving love. Father, we want our hosannas to be head and heartfelt. Today as a body, we love, we bring you those who are ill and suffering. We pray for your healing. We pray for those who are grieving. We ask you to comfort them. And we rejoice for those who are rejoicing. And in a special way, we thank you so much for David and Jessica's daughter, Sophie. We ask you to help us to be the hands and feet as we care for one another within our body. We think also of the conflict and crisis in our world. We pray for your help and resolution as we know that you can change hearts and minds. And we ask for your presence and protection and wisdom for those who are your hands and feet within the situation. We pray for our church, and we ask you that you help us to align with your priorities and intentions. We pray for our elders as they meet this week to make important decisions. We pray for both Uh, Pastor Kimball and Tanya as they are returning home this week and have a very busy season ahead of them, stepping ahead into the summer. We pray for the leadership seminar that is to begin this week, and we ask that you will reveal and affirm your gifts in those who are attending, and that they will find opportunities to utilize those gifts as you designed it. Father, we thank you for your word, and that we're able to hear and learn from it together as a body. We thank you for Kellum and the message that he has um, prepared and to share with us today. And we're grateful for the gift of technology. We pray your hand of protection over the technology so that it will work. But we, allow, we are just um, in awe of the fact that we can continue to worship together even though we are miles apart. Father, today we love you. We worship you. Hosanna. Hey everyone at College Drive, Uh, it is so good to be back, uh, even virtually, to come and share 
with you. It's weird at my end, I'm sitting in my office with my camera set up and, and it's just kind of weird to be talking, feels like talking to myself, but I really hope that uh, you are encouraged by our time together today. I wish I was there in person and hopefully one day soon I will be, um, but I'm just honored to be able to come and share. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be, to be back uh, in a sense. Um, just a quick update, uh, Jazz and the girls are doing great. Uh, it is raining at the moment, it is flooding again. I'm not sure if you've ever seen, been watching the news uh, around Australia, but we've been having some floods recently. Um, but everyone's okay, it's all, it's all fine where we are. But Jazz and the girls are good. Uh, Scylla is beautiful and healthy and happy. Uh, Jazz isn't getting much sleep, but she's healthy and happy as well. And Zara is just running around like a crazy lunatic. Uh, the same as always. And she's just growing up so well and beautiful and uh, loves reading her Bible and uh, is, is learning so many new words. And she's just the life of the party wherever we go. And so nothing has changed in that sense. And so it's really good to be able to share. Uh, I am here at Cape and Rain, Australia, and we're doing really well with the school. Small numbers, but we're excited to see uh, more internationals come again uh, soon. This morning, uh, we are going to be picking up and, and, and journeying along in your series through Mark. Uh, which is funny because we were doing we we're doing Mark when I was there, so still still going through Mark, um, and uh, and today we're we're up to a portion in Mark fourteen, uh, and and it really is talking about a concentration of failures. There are three failures listed in this text today. It is a biggie. Uh, it's a long text, but to 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 navigate it, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of the three stories that are intertwined individually, and then we're going to zoom out and see how they all work together to point to Jesus, and then we're going to see what it looks like, and we're going to see how Jesus is a fulfillment uh, of these three human failures. And so let me pray, uh, and then we're going to get into our first portion of our text this morning. Father, I thank you so much. Uh, for College Drive Church. I thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share again, Lord. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. But above all that, may you be glorified. Uh, may we see you. May we hear your voice. May we see your fingerprint uh, and, and, and recognize your voice in Scripture. May you reveal to us what you have for us today. Uh, and may we see this text with fresh eyes. Um, and I just pray that you'll be glorified. They would speak through me and through this preparation, but more so that uh, that you would just speak audibly and into the hearts of everyone watching this. Um, Lord, I thank you for the relationship that we have uh, with with College Drive and myself. And I just pray that you'll be glorified and honored uh, by our time here uh, this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, I'm gonna get myself uh, ready here. We are gonna be reading. Uh, uh, from uh, Mark 14, picking up in verse 27. So hopefully I've got that right. So, well, it's too late to, to tell me otherwise. So hopefully that's where you guys are up to. So we're in Mark 14, 27, picking up around Jesus's uh, 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 predicting Peter's denial. And so as far as context, as you guys know, uh, this is after uh, Jesus has been anointed at Bethany and uh, after the Lord's Supper where Jesus is pointing and foreshadowing the, the broken body and the spilt blood, highlighting the fact that he is the Passover lamb. And, and, and this is all in preparation for the cross. The cross is coming, uh, and this is all the pathway uh, in, in preparing the hearts of the nation and preparing the hearts of the disciples. And Jesus is going through a preparation of sorts, uh, and we're going to pick up on that in just a moment. But this is all in, in, in anticipation of the climactic moment of human history, Jesus on the cross. And so here, uh, Jesus is talking about his own death as the substitutionary atonement for the sin of mankind. And so we're going to read together. We're going to read uh, verse 27 uh, all the way to 42, and then we're going to pick up at the end as well. So uh, uh, for Mark 14, 27 says, you will all <laughs> fall away. That's what you want to hear, isn't it? Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, 
For the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But, be, but Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Uh, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to, uh, it began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh or the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. Then when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So that's the first part of this morning's text. Um, but we're going to pick up again uh, at verse 66 um, and, and picking and continuing on, on Peter. So we're going to be looking at Peter first and we're going to be looking at Judas, which we're going to come to. And then we're going to be looking at the Sanhedrin. So uh, secondly, we're going to look in, uh, at Mark 14, 66 to the end of the chapter where it says, While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by uh, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were here. You were uh, with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. He went uh, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, uh, she said again to those standing around him, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. So we're looking at this first uh, account of Peter's life. Now, these three accounts we're going to tackle in the in this portion of Scripture highlights three human failures. So the th our three failures. So Peter's failure here is his failure uh, to keep his promise. In this dialogue, in the initial uh, dialogue, we, we see uh, Jesus say, uh, or quote, you will all fall away, he told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now here is, uh, Jesus is actually quoting Zechariah where God is the one who strikes the shepherd, shepherd who is close to me in the, in the, in the, in the rest of the chapter as part of his purification of his people, cleansing them of sin. The fact that Jesus is re referencing a, a, a shepherd being struck uh, may be familiar to you because Jesus has already referred to himself as a shepherd. John 10, 11, uh, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So it, it's particularly striking that Zechariah writes that it is God who does the striking and not the enemy. It's not the serpent. It's not the, the devil or whatever. It's the father striking the shepherd, striking Jesus. And so this is, is reminiscent of uh, Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice, the father uh, punishing and, and, and offering his son as a sacrifice. Obviously, in Abraham's account, God provides a substitute, a ram. Here, Jesus is that substitute where the father kills and, and offers his son as a sacrifice. He is he, the, the, the father is striking the shepherd of his people, uh, and the substitute is Jesus himself. To this, Peter declares, even if all fall away, I will not. Jesus knows that Peter's heart was, if not righteous, was noble, 
uh, but that he wasn't going to be able to live up to his end of the bargain. So this is not the first time that there are two parties involved where one member is unable to live up to their end of the bargain and there are provisions made for that party. All the way back in, 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 uh, in, in Abram's time, in Genesis 15, we see that God uh, gave uh, Abram, before Abraham, before his name was Abraham, it was Abram, gave Abram a vision. Uh, a dark, he fell into a deep, dark sleep and, 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 and he saw a flaming fire pot and a flaming torch pass through the sacrificed animals that Abraham had been instructed to sacrifice. So the, sac the animals were real, but the vision, he saw uh, this flaming fire pot and this torch pass through. It sounds kind of weird and wacky, um, but what is simply happening here is that God is making a covenant with Abram. He's making promises. Uh, think of it like a contract. Uh, there, are, there are stipulations, there is an agreement, there are two parties who are, in, who are coming together in agreement around this contract, uh, and, 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 and the agreement pretty much says, if either one of us, either God or Abraham, doesn't live up to their end of the bargain, may they be like these animals that have been literally cut in half, which sounds pretty gruesome, may they be sacrificed. But instead of Abraham and God passing through and walking through this in agreement to one another, Abraham sees uh, God and the, the, the pot and the torch representing the spirit of God and, and God um, passing through. And this is saying, in essence, even if you, Abraham, even if you do not live up to your end of the covenant, I will pay the price. I am making the agreement with you. But whatever happens, knowing what's going to happen, God pr cr uh, cr um, provided provisions for Abram's or humanity's lack of faith and inability to live up to the law, which was going to come. And so here we see uh, God punishing Jesus uh, for the sins of humanity. And so uh, the reason why I wanted to allude to this, because this is not the first time this is coming up. God is striking the shepherd. This has been, the preparation for the cross has been building and building and we're getting closer and closer to that time. So Jesus here is bearing the weight of uh, Peter's failures as he will soon bear the weight of his sin. Uh, looking at that uh, time of, of sleeping, uh, we see Peter fail a second time. The first time is uh, not adhering to Jesus's warnings um, about ultimately denying denying him, and we'll get to that. But Peter's failing again a second time uh, uh, because he fails to stand by Jesus in his in in, in this greatest time of need. Um, I don't know if you've ever done a movie marathon before. Uh, I've done my fair share uh, growing up in my teen years. I feel like that was all we had to do in my small town of Cambridge was just watch movies uh, all night. And so it became a thing, though. So uh, I remember we watched uh, um, Matrix Marathon. That was grim. But the Lord of the Rings Marathon, that was the best. So we did. I don't think we had the extended edition back in those days, but that would have been great. And uh, and so me and a couple of friends uh, stayed up. Uh, we watched the first Lord of the Rings, as you know, the three hours plus each. Um, and uh, and so we watched the first one, loving it. It's like it was, at this point, it's like 11 p.m. Had a quick break. Uh, did a you know had some snacks and stuff like that. Watched the second one. By the end of the second one, it was well into the morning and it was getting kind of grim. Had a bit of a break, went outside, ran around. And when we came to the third one, it was so hard to stay awake. It was like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and we we're all exhausted. And as much as I love Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings, it was tough. The only thing that got us through was, it sounds really bizarre, but we, I didn't drink coffee at this stage, but we had these little uh, mints, like, uh, like a Mentos kind of thing. And uh, we'd eat those and it would give us enough sugar, enough energy to kind of keep us awake while we're eating it. But as soon as it dissolved, it kind of like we just lost the sugar rush and just started to fall asleep again. So we'd take turns waking each other up and having a responsibility. Anyway, all that to say, staying up at night isn't easy. I'm sure you've probably had situations like that. Early flights, late flights, all that sort of stuff. And so the, 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 the flesh... Is, is failing here and Peter is falling asleep with James and John when Jesus 
really uh, needs that support, needs that comforting. And so uh, while Peter, James, and John are falling, uh, uh, failing to stand with Jesus in prayer throughout the night, Jesus was beseeching God, asking if there was any other way. Mark, in his account here, is recording vividly Jesus' humanity. It's on clear display for us to see. Jesus was distressed, to say the least, in the face of the crucifixion. Now, the crucifixion, as we know, is excruciating. It was an awful torture. It was an awful, slow, painful death. It was terrible. But as bad as it was physically, Jesus was more concerned about the spiritual element to what was happening. Jesus didn't, the, the punishment wasn't just physical death. It was a spiritual uh, weight of the consequence of sin. In fact, Jesus was fearing uh, what, we, what he called the cup. Uh, the cup Jesus was referring to uh, has been seen as a picture throughout scripture as being the uh, uh, as being an illust illustration of the wrath of God on sin, we can see this in a number of places. I, I'm just picking, hamping a few. Isaiah fifty one seventeen. It says, "Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of His wrath, not wrath. That doesn't sound very terrifying. Wrath is, is more." Trem causes trembling, and who have drained it to its dregs the goblet that makes people stagger. In fact, Jesus referred to this in uh, in his own ministry in, in, in Matthew 20. He says, don't you know what you are asking? Jesus said to them, uh, he's talking about to the disciples wanting to sit at his right and his left, can you drink, drink the cup I'm about to drink? We can, they answered. And Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup. But this is really interesting because Jesus is, is referring to the wrath of sin that Jesus is going to carry and, and acknowledge, uh, kind of helping them see, you don't know what you're asking. There's no way you can bear the weight of the sin of humanity on your shoulders. Can you bear this weight? And then they said, sure we can. And Jesus said, uh, you will. Uh, you will indeed drink my cup. But what was, he was talking about was not the, the full weight of, of the sin of humanity, uh, but this was uh, uh, talking about participating in the sufferings of Jesus. And, and Paul picks this up in Philippians 3.10, and he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You see, we each in Christ die to sin, not under the weight of sin, but die to sin in participating in the sufferings of Jesus. So yes, we uh, share the cup, but it was ultimately fulfilled by Jesus uh, receiving and, and taking upon himself the entire weight of the wrath of God on sin. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and kind of to reemphasize that, um, as, as followers of Jesus, suffering is a part of being obedient. It's not dis dislocated from obedience. It's a uh, Suffering is a part of obedience. And Jesus says that we're supposed to take up our own cross, which could be likened to take up your cup kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, be prepared for, for suffering. Be prepared for dying to self and the, and what the ripple effects of that. And so here we're seeing Peter's failures are beginning to really pile up. Thirdly, looking at the second dialogue, really quickly, we look at this quite often um, in, in, in church circles around Peter's denial. So I probably don't need to go into too much depth. But finally, Peter unintentionally fulfills Jesus's prediction uh, by denying that he even knew Jesus. Now, he, he didn't have a sword to his throat, uh, but he uh, he was intimidated. He was embarrassed. He was um, he, he realized what he knew what was going to happen. He, well, he probably saw that what Jesus was going through was awful. He didn't want to be kind of to receive the same punishment, right? Um, but he was so adamant that he he was trying to get this get this conversation moving in a different direction. And he started cursing and and bringing calling curses down on himself. It's just 
bizarre, but it was like, is as though Peter was saying, look, I don't know, I don't bleeping, bleeping, bleeping know this guy, you know? And so just to kind of emphasize his, um, his intensity uh, of his denial, it wasn't just a, oh, yeah, you know, fudging it. It was a direct uh, rejection of his identification with Jesus. Uh, and it wasn't until the rooster crowed the second time that it actually dawned on Peter uh, what he had done. He had failed to uh, the one that he promised to protect and promised to serve and promised to follow faithfully, uh, even if he had to die. And we didn't see it. Didn't the sword wasn't at his throat? He didn't have a gun to his head. It was just an accusation of some of a, of a young girl uh, that that brought him to his knees. Um, and so uh, this, it's just really striking here. Um, uh, and, and this was ultimately too much for Peter. So that was Peter's failure. And, and so now I want us to look at the next f- account of failure in our text today. The second is Judas's failure. Uh, how Judas failed to resist the devil. So let's pick it up um, uh, in our text here. Uh, so looking at Jesus' arrest um, in verse 43 to 52. It says, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a, cr- a crowd of armed, a, a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them: "The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard." Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, "Rabbi," and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. The, uh, then one of those standing near drew his sword. We know who that was talking about from the other accounts and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Uh, Jesus replied and said, am I sending a rebellion? Jesus said that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then uh, everyone deserted him and fled. Then Mark adds uh, uniquely adds this kind of piece at the end. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, uh, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. I just think it's hilarious that that's included. Um, Maybe hilarious is probably not the right word. But it's interesting uh, that people, how, where people's conclusions go to from there, some, some people conclude that uh, that was actually Mark alluding to himself uh, because it wasn't recorded elsewhere. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to speak to that necessarily. But here we're talking about Judas's betrayal, Judas's, Judas's failure to ultimately resist the devil. Uh, to many of us, Judas has been seen as the perfect antagonist to the Messiah. Uh, Jesus, uh, the Christ, the promised one, the uh, the Messiah to come and rescue humanity. Then there's this, uh, f- a friend who betrays him at, at his greatest hour of need. Uh, and so uh, we can see uh, this Judas character really demonized. Uh, in fact, Dante, uh, I'm going to throw up a picture, uh, portrayed Jesus, uh, Judas, sorry, being eaten by Satan in the ninth level of hell, in his poem, The Divine Comedy. So the, you know, we, we've seen Jesus as the picture of ultimate sin, the one who betrayed the Son of God. Yes, Judas's failure is um, indescribable. It's, it's foretold and it's awful. It's horrific. But it simply comes down to his inability to resist uh, the temptations of Satan. What, where Jesus was tempted uh, in, in the desert, Judas is tempted. And we see that Jesus stood where Judas failed. Um, John 13, 12, it says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Looking back um, at, uh, at, at the account even of Cain, we, we know that the devil in many ways tempts all of us and, and none of us are immune to the temptations of the enemy. Looking back in Genesis 4, uh, we see this uh, demonstrated in a, in a different situation, of course, but the same occurrence is happening here. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You see, the problem is that like Cain, uh, we as Judas, like Judas, are unable to rule over sin. Sin is an internal corruption of our DNA. And, 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 and each and every one of us have allowed sin to rule over us. We've allowed sin to have us in the same way that sin was crouching and wanted uh, Cain. Uh, the, the devil tempted Judas. And we are not immune to that temptation. Sin wants you. I think it would be unwise to flippantly vilify Judas uh, with, without first uh, acknowledging uh, the sin in our own hearts. Uh, just like Jesus told those without sin to cast the first stone, we should be really slow to judge Judas without seeing that same sin in our own hearts. You see in Matthew 7, 3 to 5, uh, Jesus says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, Judas didn't just have a speck. He had a, a, an oak tree sticking out of his eye. But But the point remains, we shouldn't think that Judas was somehow subhuman when we are, well, I'm not as bad as Judas. You know, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. We need to really come face to face with our own sin and see that it is the same sin. It's the same corruption. It's the same failure before the perfection of Jesus that exists in our own hearts. I'm not excusing Judas's behavior, of course, but rather I'm wanting us to see that Judas is in each of us. We have all failed to overcome sin like Cain. And we've all betrayed Jesus through our participation in the divine mutiny against God. The difference, however, is what we do now. Okay, that's our second failure. The first failure was Peter failing to stand by his promise and ignore, and, and recognize Jesus's authority and word and, 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 and knowing that he was going to go to the cross. And here we see Judas's failure before Jesus as well, as, 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 as failing to resist the devil. Thirdly, and mo not most significantly, but really significantly, we see this third failure in our text. We're going to read it here. Uh, the Sanhedrin. They failed to spot the Messiah. Here, this is a, oopsie, this is a biggie. Um, Mark uh, 14, 53. It says, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the, and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple in, and in three days uh, will build, uh, build another not made by man. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes, his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He said, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit on him. They, uh, they blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Here, 
we see the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, ultimately fail to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus was not the Messiah they wanted. They were wanting a military leader to overthrow the Romans' rule. And and they'd been waiting for this Messiah to come their whole lives for generations and generations. They've been eagerly awaiting the, the Son of Man to come and rescue them. Ironically, it was actually Jesus who did overthrow the Romans, but it was through a very, very different process than a military campaign. But in this text, Jesus gives an incredible insight to his nature. And this portion of scripture is highly, highly debated over and is critical to understanding of, of the nature of Jesus. Earlier in our passage, we, we looked at, uh, Mark laid out for us clearly Jesus' humanity in, in, the, in Gethsemane where Jesus is bearing his heart before the Father, saying, if there's any other way, please, let's do that. But I understand that this is your way, not my way. So his submission to the Father. So we see uh, his his agony. We see the, the humanity of Jesus revealed. Here, we see the other side to his nature, the other side to the coin. And the other side of his nature is his divine nature. Now, in verse uh, 62, Jesus not only states clear as day that he is, in fact, the Messiah, the one that they were looking for, the Savior, but he also goes another step uh, to, to uh, unveil his identity from the Old Testament. And we're looking here in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And it says, uh, it's really worth a, a, a text become familiar with. In Daniel 7, it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, just like Jesus said. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Oh man, I could spend a good six hours in this passage. I, am, I love this text and I love how it, it ties in with this crimson thread through scripture. However, I'm not going to do that to you, but I just wanted to point out and highlight a, a few things from here. First, Jesus used this term, son of man, almost exclusively to identify himself uh, throughout the Gospels, in his ministry, in his preaching, he called himself that term, the Son of Man. And, 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 and this was him repeatedly pointing to Daniel chapter 7. He said, I am that Son of Man. You familiar with that text? Yeah, it's about me. The term Son of Man literally means human. But as you can see, there is something very different about this human. So in, in this term is also used uh, in Ezekiel, uh, talk, where God is talking to Ezekiel and saying human. Um, and so it does mean human, but there is something unique about this particular human in Daniel 7. Kind of doing some theology around this, uh, you may be familiar in, in the Ten Commandments that it is very clear that no one ought to be worshipped aside from God himself. And in this text, we see that a man was not only worshipped alongside the Ancient of Days, which was strictly forbidden, but also that this human, this son of man, was given sovereign power. This is huge because this is not fitting for the average guy down the street. This human is worshipped as God. And that fits. It, when, 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 when seen through the lens of the commandments, this is no mere human in, the, in, 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 a, in a general sense. Those at the Sanhedrin knew exactly what he was saying by this reference, uh, which is why they accused him of blasphemy. They saw what was going on in, 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 in pointing to, and referencing the Daniel passage 
they knew that Jesus was likening himself to the Ancient of Days, to be worshipped with God, as God, as sovereign, uh, as, uh, as given entire authority, and, and, has, uh, and being given an everlasting dominion. That doesn't sound like a, a human. That sounds like the description of God. And, and we see here that Jesus has two sides to his nature. He had one side which is fully human, the other side which is fully divine. Here, though, though they acknowledged his biblical reference, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, failed to recognize the Messiah. They had waited their whole lives for this Messiah, and they looked him in the eye, and they turned the other way. Okay. So we've looked at three human failures, the three failures of humanity. One, failure to live up to our promises. Second, failure to resist sin and resist the devil. And third, failure to recognize Jesus as God and recognize him as our savior, as our Messiah. So in this, this portion of the text, where it fits is really important because it's all in preparation for the cross. Now, I want us to look not at humans' failure or humanity's failure, which is portrayed clearly by these three, but I want us to look at Jesus. You see, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus succeeded or, 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 or had victory where, uh, where, human, where, where man fails, where Peter failed, where Judas failed, where Cain failed, where Abram failed where every human who has ever lived failed, Jesus succeeded. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He is pure. He is spotless. And it is he who died in our place as our substitutionary sacrifice. A very big word that says a substitute and replacement for. Where we belonged, Jesus died. The gospel teaches us that not that we are supposed to avoid failure, if that, I don't want you to hear that message as we wrap up now. I don't want you to think, all right, if I avoid the failure of Peter, if I avoid the failure of Judas, and if I avoid the failure of the, of the Sanhedrin, then maybe I can be perfect. That is not the gospel. That is not the message. And the, and the message here is not to avoid failure. It's much, much more significant than that. The, the message here is to put our trust into Jesus as the one who never failed. This is the substitute. This is the one that replaces us. What Where we belonged, he died. But where he belongs, we inherit. Amazing. This is the mystery of the, of the cross. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. And we're going to wrap it up. Charles Spurgeon says, My hope lives not because I am not a sinner, but because I am a sinner for whom Christ died. My trust is not that I am holy, but that being unholy, he is my righteousness. My faith rests not upon what I am or shall be or feel or know, but in what Christ is. I get goosebumps. I love this. But in what Christ is, in what he has done and in what he is now doing for me. Hallelujah. Oh, I, ju I should have just read that quote and like rap and turn the camera. That hits it home for me. It's not that I am perfect. It's not that I, I'm not confident in my own holiness, but I'm confident in him, in, what, in who he is, in what he has done, in what he is continuing to do for me. Oh, I love this. It is my hope this morning that you would not make excuses for your sin, Make excuses for your failures. Try to dodge and, and duck and weave and say, well, it's not fair, I, whatever. That's not the message that I hope you walk away with. Because God can see through all of that. But my hope is that you would do what the Sanhedrin did not do. I hope that you this morning will recognize Jesus. That you would see him, look him in the eyes and see him as that son of man, that human who is also divine, who is worshipped, who is divine, who is a, a, a sovereign, 
power and authority and everlasting dominion. He is the lamb that died in our place. That is our king who didn't just die, but rose again victorious because death could not hold him. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice, too perfect for the grave. I hope that you recognize Jesus for who who he is. I hope you recognize Jesus for what he has done for you on the cross. And I hope that you would recognize Jesus for what he is continuing to do in you and for you now. Because he's not finished. He is still uh, alive. He's still living. And he's still working in and for you. If you don't know Jesus uh, for yourself, um, it is my greatest desire and, 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 and hope that you would uh, see Jesus as the perfect sacrifice, the one who is spotless and perfect, dying in your place so that you don't have to be. But as, as you put your trust and belief in him, that you receive his perfection and receive forgiveness for every sin that you've ever committed and ever will commit. If, you're, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus this morning, I, my prayer is that you would do that this morning, even right now. Uh, but for those of us who are still growing and, and, and walking in our relationship with Jesus, uh, may this serve as a deep encouragement that he is perfect where we are not. And that is the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for our time together this morning. I thank you for this rich and beautiful text. Uh, it's a biggie. Uh, But Lord, um, may you continue to shine through your word to speak to our heart uh, and that we would have heard you this morning. May uh, we recognize your voice as the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd, that great shepherd who was struck by the father. And the sheep were scattered, but Jesus rose again from the grave, restoring and, 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 and bringing together that which had been lost. Lord, that Jesus, I thank you so much that you died for me, a broken sinner, and that you love me. I'm unworthy, but I'm so thankful, eternally grateful. And I thank you for everyone who is, who is, in, is, is, is watching this. I pray that they would be encouraged and they would, in the same way, honor you, thank you, glorify you for your beauty and perfection and and ultimate sacrifice on the cross so that we may be restored back to you. Thank you for this time together, Jesus. I pray that you would continue to speak into our hearts as we go from here in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Thank you, Callum, for that, if you're watching online. And uh, thank you, everyone, to, who showed up today. Uh, please rise for the benediction. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you again so much for coming, and we'll sing one more song, and then you're dismissed.
you this week. We'll see you next Sunday. Take care.